Misogyny, Episode 4, Season 1, What Has My Attention. It's subtitled Dislike of, Contempt for, or Ingrained Prejudice Against Women. And today I'm having a conversation with Karen Brzezanski, who can be found at theluckysoul.com, and she's a certified life coach, pro EFT tapping coach, mindset enthusiast, and trauma thriver. We're also joined by Stephanie Murphy from mesavistawellness.com, and she has so many letters behind her name. I'm not going to repeat them, but it is very notable that she's really a great art therapist, and at Mesa Vista Wellness, she's an art therapy supervisor. So all three of us wanted to have a conversation about misogyny, and from my perspective being a man, I was very eager with open ears to hear what they would have to say from their perspective. And by the end of this episode, it was apparent that there was so much more to talk about, so I'm sure there'll be more episodes on this. Also, Stephanie, back in 2007, had a conversation with Craig S. Barnes, the author of In Search of the Lost Feminine, which back then had a huge impact on me, and also Stephanie. And that interview with Stephanie is actually included at the end of this episode. So now I bring you Karen Brzezanski, Stephanie Murphy, and myself, John Beethan, and we're talking about misogyny. Today's topic is misogyny. And uh, hmm, I'm thinking you both probably, uh, you got a chance to listen to the interview with Craig Barnes that Stephanie did in 2005 or something? Yeah. So what so you what'd you think? Ago. I thought it was great. Um, I thought it was so interesting. He said, uh, marriage is the cornerstone of patriarchy because men needed to know which sons, which boys were theirs so they could pass on their, you know, their fortunes or whatever. I just, I thought it was so disturbing, you know, because women were kind of, you know, being free and having going around with whatever partners they wanted to. And then the men were like, well, we don't know which boys are ours. So how do we, you know, how do we keep our familial alignment going for generations? Oh, we should marry them. So women only have one man. And that way we know, you know, which, which sons are there, which are theirs belong to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is as if that really worked. I know, right? <laughs> I'm like, maybe that's like the thing. Maybe there's something in my lineage with women who like didn't want to get married or something or because like I've never had like a big pull to get married. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. I wonder if any of that, you know, has anything to do with it because I'm. You just want to be footloose and fancy free. I get it. You know, for, for for most of my life, I was hesitant and resistant to the idea of marriage. And only in my late 30s have I warmed up to the idea of, of getting married and actually, um, you know, realize that, that that is something that I want moving forward. Um, but it definitely wasn't something that I want for most of my life. So what do you think changed for you? Um, I think just understanding that marriage can be something different than what I saw growing up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Stephanie, do you want to give a little synopsis of the book um, in search of the lost feminine, which was the book that Craig wrote that spawned that whole workshop that we actually did in Santa Fe, but also spawned the conversation you had with Craig Barnes, which I probably am going to include at the end of this episode or at least yeah. portions of. So you want to tell us a little? Craig Barnes uh, was an activist attorney in Colorado. And um, how he came to do research about uh, the power of women is that He had a huge lawsuit. Um, He was fighting for the rights of nurses in Colorado. And um, because they were overworked, underpaid, 
And it was very um, obvious that there were nurses, women nurses with the same amount of experience as male nurses, and they were making like so much less money, um, had less opportunity. And so uh, he went to bat for them. And if I remember correctly, 2005 was a long time ago. Um, mm -hmm. it, did it go to the Supreme Court, John? No. N it didn't no, go it that didn't. high. No, um, no, no. But he lost, I mean, it was like years in the making of this case and working with so many nurses. And um, Craig was a fabulous researcher. And he was so dismayed when he lost the case for these nurses. And he just like was brokenhearted for them and said, this is so not fair. And where the hell did all of this come from? And why is this okay in our world? Because it doesn't feel okay. Wasn't there something about the judge, like not even like reviewing the case, like the details of the case? Like he he was just like, no, she's a woman or they're women. So that's why. And I'm not even going to bother like pretending that I think anything different based on the facts that are presented. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I had forgotten that part. Um, yeah. So he wrote this book in search of the lost feminine and um, I, the book is still in print. Um, it's a great book. He um, he talks about the whole journey of um, fighting for these nurses and losing and what, what the taste that that left in his mouth. And so he did a whole lot of historical research. And it's great what you picked up from that last interview was really the thing that stunned me as well. To interrupt you, uh, he and his wife, Michaela, and two of their closest friends went to Greece. That was like after the trial. He was so distraught. Uh -huh. And that's when his curiosity arose because he kept on looking at these figures of demonetized women. And that's, I, as I remember it, that's where he kind of went, what's that about? And women were, the, the women were the landholders. The women ran everything and um and yeah moms always know who her children are moms always know which boy is hers and the men didn't really like that very much and so so that was um a big piece of what craig discovered that marriage was actually an institution created by men so that they could have the power of the next generation, whether it was tilling their fields or owning the land or the livestock or whatever it was. Um, yeah, pretty interesting. I, um, I wanted to look up the word misogyny in the dictionary. Like, I just was so curious. So, you know, what does the dictionary say? So I have this, like, 20-pound, like, a gigantic, <laughs> I can't carry it around because it's so big, but it is the uh, Random House um, Dictionary, unabridged edition of the Random House Dictionary of the entire English language. And... It own, the only thing that this dictionary says under the word misogyny says three words, hatred of women. Wow. That's all it says. Uh, and I'm kind of shocked about that. I think it's more nuanced than hatred of women. I think so, too. And when we hear the word, we think of how that word has warped into meaning something else. Yeah. What do you think? I mean, I, I think that there are very good hearted, you know, wonderful men who can at times exhibit misogynistic speech or behavior, you know, and, and honestly, like through no fault of their own, like it's they're programmed. 
just as much as we are. They've been raised in a certain way to believe certain things, to not ask certain questions. And we've been raised in a certain way to believe certain things, to not ask certain questions, to not think twice about things. So I think it's like, you know, we're all learning right now. And, um, you know, yeah, I think that we need to, as women, like hold space for, for men, you know, making some mistakes and gently bringing them, you know, just bringing whatever it is that they said or did to their awareness and saying, you know, hey, <laughs> can we back up for just a second? Because I want to share something with you. You know, I had to do that recently with a friend of mine. We were in a, a meeting together with another woman who, um, you know, is not is is pretty unafraid to speak up and just share her voice. And she was running the meeting and he made a comment to me outside the meeting saying that he wouldn't ever want to be in a real professional relationship with her, meaning that she was kind of bossy and like aggressive. And I kind of had to say to him, I said, you would you would never have said that to me if, if, if that was a man. And I think he was a little taken aback, <laughs> but he did hear it, which was really good. And I, I was just, you know, I was kind of gently, and this is, I mean, it's very hard as a woman to even bring this up, you know, even to someone who I, I is a friend of mine and who I know has an open mind and an open heart. So, yeah. So even just like bringing that up to him was, was a little scary. And then I'm like, oh, he's going to think the same thing about me because I'm speaking up and he's going to think I'm a bitch and he's going to think I'm too assertive or aggressive or, you know, I'm one of those women. And, and then I just have to remind myself, like, so what, like, what if he does? And that's okay. That doesn't, that doesn't mean anything about me. It just means that I'm speaking up and I'm sharing, you know, something that I saw that doesn't sit well with me anymore. Yes. Because in the past I, I may have agreed with him. Mm -hmm. It actually doesn't sit well with me as well. Yeah. I mean, it really doesn't. But those the, are like the little, like what I see is like microaggressions against women, you know, where it's like, oh, I don't like the tone of her speech or I don't like how she speaks. Out. And I see it on both sides from men and from women. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just, it's very judgmental. And I think we need to be very, very careful about that kind of thing. If I may say too, I think part of in the last probably 40, 50 years, part of the problem has been that, um, you know, uh, boys have not been taught to respect women from their father. Yeah. Boys have not, you know, there's, there's that. I mean, most of the men I know, including myself, have a very strong relationship with their mother. And um, it, for me, my mother passed, but strongly intuitive. So we, we could talk about anything very much like I observe in women who can pretty much talk about anything, you know? So I think a lot of it is, you know, men just are, I should say boys just haven't uh, been modeled very well at all. And then I think it all started, Joseph Campbell talked about uh, the industrial revolution where it all started when men left the farm to work in the factory and uh, it would be a very long, hard day and they would come back and just have no energy or anything for their family. And so their relationships with their son was very different than when they were working on the farm. Mm. And five o'clock, we'll go out and do whatever we need to do and milk the cows and sort of like that. So there was no relationship mm -hmm. with a father and a son, really. So I think, I think, um, I mean, I take responsibility for that personally. I really do. Because in the community of people that, and men that I spend time with, and largely, largely it's a chamber of commerce, I don't have any problems speaking up in a pod of men that are displaying disrespect. Mm. But, uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm listening and I'm going to like, uh, shut up now because I really want to hear your all perspective because I, I don't, I don't think I am void of this and I'm sure it comes up in my relationship with, with, uh, women. I just, um, I'm just, I need to be more aware of it, even though I think I'm perfect. Well, I mean, I am perfect, but <laughs> So do I, I, mean, I, don't think, I don't think young, young men or boys are taught how to 
be how to really embody their emotional life or give words to it. And also what I found interesting when I was reading um, Untamed by Glennon Doyle, uh, she was talking about how like, you know, we have all these feminine qualities of compassion and love and forgiveness and mercy and understanding and things like that. And then, you know, the flip side of all the masculine qualities. And it's like, she, she asked a question, like, why are we labeling them as masculine and feminine? Mm -hmm. And I, it's like, we're not, our boys aren't taught to be compassionate, loving, forgiving, emotional, merciful humans. They're taught to be tough and angry and, you know, not really show emotion. And if they show emotion, they're a pussy, which that alone has is problematic, you know, just using that language. So. Yeah. I, what, one thing I wanted to say is that the other problem with that, not experiencing that, not experiencing mm -hmm. emotion, a man experiencing emotion and everything else is that they completely are devoid of a whole experience in life. Yeah. They only, they only experience life through sports, um, you know, whatever, whatever it is. And there's a, there's a, there's a whole nother thing happening. And I, I've mentioned, I mentioned before, it's like when I go to these chamber events, I find myself naturally gravitating towards the groups of women. And the reason is, is that they have a tendency to, well, not tendency, they, they'll, they talk at a much deeper level in terms of what they care about. Yeah. You and know, I, I just, and, and, and men don't have, a, most men can't even go there. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's there, it's too scary. And it's like, well, I don't want to be girly. That's like a girly thing to do. Or I don't want to look like I don't know anything or I'm not oh, yeah. intelligent or I don't have my power base. And and I'm wondering about the definition of misogyny, fear of women. Is that really an accurate definition? Could it be more fear of what women are capable of displaying and they're afraid they don't know how to do that or they can't do that or they can't join in that compassionate, gentle loving and still be strong kind of way. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. it's like a not knowing creates fear. Yeah. You know, look at what's happening with COVID-19, the not knowing about our future and what that's going to look like and how we're going to roll out a new, a new kind of living, a new kind of socialization. It's creating fear all over the place. And people are doing mm -hmm. stupid things because of that fear of the unknown. So I am just really curious about, is it really fear of, I mean, what is there to fear of women? You know, what is there to fear really? And on the flip side, how many women get on the bandwagon of men bashing? Yeah, that's a big problem. Too. It's kind of the same thing, you know, that yeah. same kind of, ooh, bad energy, pushing it away, and I'm not going to have anything to do with you, and and I'm better than you are. Yeah, I've had to push friends out of my life because they couldn't stay out of that conversation, and I can't be in it. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And I'm like, I just cannot join in that conversation. And I feel like it is so toxic to my, my own mindset that I'm like, I, I, and it's like, it just keeps coming up over and over and over. And there's only so much that you can say in a kind way before you're just like, you know, shut the fuck up and yes. <laughs> I yes. can't be around this anymore. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Cause you're, you're really only serving to imprint the, yeah, the, the, the negative idea that, that that's actually true. And it really speaks to um, generational wounding and the unconsciousness of how we're programmed from our family of origin, you know, like talking about, you know, sons are not taught by their fathers. Who were their fathers taught by? 
Right, and right. if there wasn't teaching from great grandpa, then, you know, it gets missed generationally and it keeps going down the line until somebody has c- some kind of uh, consciousness experience that says, hey, wait a second, I'm not doing this anymore. Like mm-hmm. you have with your friends that want to, you know, bash and, and wow. uh, be intolerant and judgy and critical and shaming. And it's like, hey, wait, I'm not playing that anymore. That is not okay yeah. with me. So I, I'm out of yeah, here. Well, if, if, I, if I may, for me, um, I don't, my father at this level wasn't real available for me. My grandfathers definitely weren't, but the matriarch was. But I think the way that I got in touch with, quote unquote, my feminine side in much later when I was studying at the Lewis Foundation, you know, we did exercises on masculine feminine. So I got really good at balancing. But what happened to me at a very young age, at the age of five, was my connection to music. So that's basically how I got in touch with that feminine side within myself. So really, ever since after that, I always, always started gravitating towards that feminine creative side in myself rather than, rather than, uh, you know, the more masculine activities like, you know, football or anything like that. Although I really enjoyed baseball and still do (laughs) lefty, but you know, for me, that's what happened. And so. I, you know, when I think about men my own age that I grew up with and everything, those men that are in touch with them, um, they're in touch with themselves in a pretty balanced way, um, always had some creative thing going on. Whether, like, Steph, if you remember Leonardo at Southside Cafe, mm-hmm. he was an artist, but his fam- their family had a business, and most of them were, like, really pretty aggressive. But Leonardo was, like, he was pretty feminine, creative, and just had feeling, you know? So, yeah, I, I, you know, the, the, the big question is, is how do we wake up men to this? That's the kind of question I'd love to get some feedback on from you because Karen, you told me the other day that you were going over to somebody's house, some guys that were having some, I don't oh, know. Oh, oh my God. Yeah, t- tell it, tell me about that. Tell it. <laughs> oh, the backstory. Um, yeah, I have a, a, a male friend who meets with a bunch of his male friends, maybe like, I think it's like between like five and eight other male friends. And they talk about dating and relationships and masculine, feminine kinds of stuff. And we found ourselves uh, on the phone one day. We It was supposed to be like a five minute call. It wound up being almost two hours. I think we we're on the phone. And it just snowballed into this conversation about dating and relationships and masculine, feminine, what men want, what women want. And he was kind of sharing some of the stuff that they were talking about in his man group. And I was giving him feedback on that. And I was like, oh, no, like, not that. We don't want that. We definitely want this and, you know, things like that. And he was just like, his mind was kind of blown when I was sharing some of what I was sharing with him. And I, I was just like, I'm like, I can't believe, like, it's so like for, for women, I just feel like, you know, I, every time I talk to my women friends, I'm like, it's so simple. Like if guys only know, knew how simple it was and they're making it so complicated and he was just, you know, he was kind of shocked. And I, I said at the end of the conversation, I'm like, I feel like we should get together, you know, and talk about this. Like I can gather some of my lady friends and bring them to your man group and maybe we can have a a conversation. (laughs) And he was like, cool, like that. Let me, let me talk to my man group and you talk to your lady friends and we'll try and work it out. Could we, could we podcast this? Oh, I don't think so. <laughs> it's been it's been kind of a, a little bit. Of, it's taken some effort to kind of get it together. I know, I know, because both, I know. both sides, if you will, um, are a little hesitant to, to go into the conversation, especially like, you know, the only people that really know each other are me and this dude. And then he knows his friends. I know my friends. So we're all new to each other. So maybe at some point we can do a recorded conversation, but definitely not right now. So, but I can definitely report back with the, 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 uh, 
general brushstroke results. <laughs> oh, pl- <laughs> please do what be on Instagram and everything else. <laughs> but, but they were saying, like he was saying, like, you know, men are confused now nowadays, like with powerful women out there. Like, do we approach them? Do we wait for them to approach us? Like, do we open the door? Do we not open the door? Do we pay? Do we not pay? We want to be gentlemen, but we also want to be respectful. You know, there we want to respect the, the feminist, the feminist nature of women that seems to be happening right now and so they're like they're confused as to what to do and there, yeah. there's t- there's two things i know stephanie's raising her hand she wants to talk there's two like, two hang on <laughs> i usually say ladies first but not <laughs> so, <laughs> so because I have, uh, uh, no so um so here's the way i approach that just so you know because first number one is men are confused is a general statement so when we say things like that men are confused and stuff don't, it's not a place I go to at all. So I, I, I work individually with people that way, you know, I just go, Hey, so my point, what I was going to say is that the way I approach it, and I really haven't had the opportunity much is, um, can I buy your dinner and, and actually have the conversation about, I am not expecting anything in return. I simply want to, can I buy your dinner? Because if it's not said, then it's hallucination exactly. on everybody's part. So, so it, it's, it comes down to, especially in our culture, humans suck at communication mm-hmm. and largely because they just don't communicate. They have a feeling, they have a thought, they don't express it. Yep. And, and the, I think that I'm still looking for both of your tips, tips for men about how to how to engage in this in this incredible opportunity to experience life in a whole new way from a quote unquote feminine perspective but um so anyway this is how i approach it so it's like the way i break into you know that whole thing with women is i just approach them pretty darn gently okay because i am aware of the dynamics and possible guards and boundaries that exist so I'm going to generally approach somebody from a, a woman from a somewhat feminine perspective, but that's because I can do both. And that's, you know, that's what men need to learn to do. There's a place for the masculine, a place for the feminine. You know, it's like, we're going to play football. Hell yeah. I'm going to beat your head in pretty darn masculine. And that's what it takes to win the game. But then with women, it's a completely different game, right? Right. So that's exactly what I was going to say, John. That was my response to what what you were sharing, Karen. It's like we think we know how it's supposed to be. We think we know what dating looks like. We think we know what relating to the opposite sex ought to flow like or sound like or feel like, which is like such a hallucination made up in everybody's head because we all have a different experience and a different wish about the the experience we're trying to have. And of course we don't know, you know? It's like I I have to go back to good old John Gray, you know, men are from Mars, women are from Venus. It's like he said some things in that book that are still true today. We are not the same animal. <laughs> mm-hmm. We have qualities of each of the sexes and we can be pretty fluid, you know, moving into energies that are traditionally labeled masculine. I've seen some pretty kick-ass women football players. You know, <laughs> and I've seen some pretty dynamic male uh, ballet dancers. You know, it's like we all have the whole deal, but but we really sabotage ourselves, limiting ourselves to have the whole experience because we say, oh, this is masculine and this is feminine and never the twain shall meet. And if we could have a conversation about what are the what are the rules in this 
dynamic exchange. You know, we never talk about, is this okay? Do you like it when I do this? Oh, I love that. Oh, do that more. Oh, say that. You know, like we don't give each other feedback about, oh, you know what? That's really a boundary for me. And that just doesn't work for me. There's a lot of mind reading that, you know, we think is happening. Like I'm expecting him to do something or act a certain way, but I'm not telling him because he should automatically know and and vice versa. I think that's where a lot of conflict arises. It's so vulnerable to actually say, this is what I want, or this is what I need, or this is what I desire. Can you give it to me? Like that feels just like, so like, you know, raw and open hearted and like, oh God, I could be rejected, you know, and you should know, by the way. (laughs) Oh, if you love me, you know what I want for Christmas. Right. Yeah. You're much more likely to get what you want for Christmas if you tell the person. Exactly. And, <laughs> and, you know, it's like, you're absolutely right. You know, it's like, yay, Brene Brown, who really has begun to talk about vulnerability and dispelling the myth of that. That is exactly what we're all searching for. That vulnerable mm-hmm. connection with another human being. and. It doesn't ever get created if we're not willing to say what works for us and ask for what we want to need. Yes, JB. I I just, I want to, I want to interject something because you you had said about three and a half minutes ago, you know, that we all have it. And I, I, I guess you're referring to a masculine and feminine. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So let's be really clear about this. We don't all have it. Whether you're a man or a woman, you have the possibility, but without the work and without the introspection and the work you do on yourself, it doesn't exist. It's only, you know, so myself as a man, when somebody, when a woman, if I'm just imagining, but if a woman say, you know, it's like you you have it, I'm going to be like looking for it, but there's nothing to be As found. If it's a tangible thing. I gotcha. I gotcha. No, exactly. I mean, you know, and it's like one of my little gems as a man that straightened me out about relationships with women was because that was really confusing when I discovered that the word, and this is in a very particular context, that the word relationship is an anomaly. It actually doesn't tangibly exist. So I found myself going, I need to know, I need to define this no matter, like I have a relationship with myself. I have a relationship with Stephanie. I have a relationship with Karen and virtually everybody else that I know. The question is, you know, what is the relationship can be simply answered by how you relate, how you relate. We're soccer buddies. We're drinking buddies. Um, you know, we, we're conversational buddies. I mean, you know, it's just, all you got to do is look at how you relate and go, that's, you know, so there's many, 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 many different kinds of relationships in terms of how we relate. So as a man, if you're a man listening to this, I would, I would suggest you look at your spouse, girlfriend, all your relationships and simply ask yourself with this particular person or with this particular group of people, how do I relate with them? And that is the definition of your relationship with them. That became very, very useful and helpful for me. Get, does that make sense? Mm-hmm. I, I, I'm done here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to mute myself. You made me think of the, the, the idea that, um, you know, I, I heard this from Yalma Van Zant many, many, many years ago. And she said, a powerful woman is the same wherever she goes. Awesome. I didn't understand that at the time. Um, because I was like, a powerful woman is the same wherever she goes. I mean, no, you're supposed to like adapt to whatever person is in front of you and this whatever the situation is. Like, that's what makes a powerful woman. Little did I know at the time. So mm-hmm. being in relationship with other people, uh, I think, you know, you should be showing up as you, as your authentic self in every single relationship. Like it shouldn't be changing dependent depending on who you're with, 
or where you are, or what the situation is. You should always be the same, essentially, uh, with with each person. Great point. Great yeah. point. Yeah, we had a we had a, a therapist intern that was in a workshop that we were doing. And she said, this was like so cute. She said, well, my professor told me something really important. She said, if you're not the same in all arenas of your life, if you're not congruent, you're dysfunctional. It was like, oh. Congruent, that's a great word. Which is what what Van Zandt is saying. It's like, and, and the unfortunate part is that we have interpretations attached to words like powerful women like yeah like oh women are not supposed to be powerful women in all aspects of their life it's like well yeah they are and what kind of spin are we putting on the term powerful women it's like what does that mean you know, oh, does it mean you're a bulldozer? No. <laughs> and so yeah. it's- I, I have I have no idea what it means. I have no idea what that means. To me, it's it's that's in the realm of of unknown and hallucination, and I I, I have no idea what it means. <laughs> so okay, so I okay, so Stephanie, and I'm going to ask Karen the same. What? How do you define a powerful woman? It's a great question, John. Um, I'm full of it. You are. That's why your eyes are brown. (laughs) (laughs) This, this portion will be edited out. (laughs) I will. um, I would define a powerful woman as um, someone who knows herself well enough that she can in any situation, create the kind of experience that she's looking for. In other words, she's true to herself. She um, asks for what she wants and needs. Uh, Perhaps it can look like she doesn't take any shit from anybody. Um, In other words, it's like, here's the game I'm playing. And Maybe uh, maybe I'm playing backgammon, and here's my rules to play backgammon. And if you would like to come play that game with me, fabulous. But if you want to play Monopoly with me, that's a completely different game, and it's not necessarily the game that I'm playing this lifetime. So uh, I, I would say... Um, a strong woman is a woman who knows who she is and is not afraid to be that. Karen? I agree with all of that. Um, And I think knows who she is and is not afraid to be that in all areas of her life, in her relationships, her spirituality, her money, her career, her family, and doesn't compromise herself or try to hide herself in any way to make peace or make other people feel a certain way. She does not take responsibility for other people's feelings, Mm -hmm. which does not mean that she does not care about other people's feelings, but she does not take responsibility for them. She knows how to set boundaries with herself and others, with her time and her energy. She does not overextend herself at the expense of, you know, herself or the things that are truly important to her. Um, She's doing, she's doing what she wants to do in the way that she wants to do it in the world and is not compromising on that. Um, And she just, she loves herself through it all. And she gives herself space for mistakes and missteps and her humanity. And so does she give other people the space for their mistakes and missteps and humanity. And always like, or at least tries to to see the light and the goodness in in other people and in the world. 
Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. So I, yeah. th th both of you, those are qualities that I wouldn't think would be much different for a man. Exactly. Think about it. Yeah. Exactly. So and that's what, not, that's, uh, hang on, that's not a girly thing at all. I mean, it's no. just how, how you're, you're talking about how you want to be in the world and with others, you know? So I don't have that long list, but I did want to offer my, my list, which is simply, and this is something I discovered that it's, it's really kind of my compass through life. So this works for me really well, not a lot of words, which is um, my strength is in my gentility. That's all. I think your everyone's true strength lies in total vulnerability and openness. Mm -hmm. Because once you say like, this is who I am, this is what I'm about. Here are my wounds, here are my strengths, here's all of me. Then you mm -hmm. become untouchable because no matter what anyone else says, it's like, you, you know, first of all, you, you might be right. Cause look, here I am, here I am. And I am all of it. I am the good, the bad, the dark, the light, and I am unashamed of it. And once you can't shame me anymore for, for something that I'm trying to hide from you, then yeah. it's just like, well, come, come to me with an open heart and an open mind. And I will meet you with, with open arms and love because I know that whatever that you have to say about me is coming from a place of fear. And that place of fear, I've already come to terms with in myself. I get it. Like, yes. I'm going to bring love to that. I'm not going to try to push against it and yes. shoot you or kill you or make you wrong or whatever or destroy you. And that is so terrifying for other people to witness that. Yeah. Because that place of uh, getting past our shame which we all have, but if we're not doing that work to heal that part of our wounding and get beyond that to that place of, I can hold anything. I have love and compassion unlimitless. Mm -hmm. That is a very powerful place. And it's very scary because the people that, um, are still carrying their wounds um, that are feeling so scarce, afraid, small, limited. Um, they don't know how to get there. And it's triggering for them. Absolutely. To, to meet someone who's like open to, to all of them. It can be triggering to them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Instead of taking a deep breath and saying, how did you learn how to do that? Teach me that. Take me where you are. Can we do this together? And, uh, and it's big work. It's tough work. And I believe that we all have that big piece of tough work to do, our soul work that we came here to do. And I don't think that we do that soul work alone. I think that we do it in community. I think we do it together. We teach each other what we need to learn and we go together. To yeah, it's not possible to do it alone. No. That's why there's three people here and we're in people. So I want to be respectful, Karen, of your time. It's uh, We have about seven minutes left. So I'm wondering if it makes sense to take it a full circle back to in search of the, of the lost feminine or not. Well, I think the, the, I think what's being called to surface now is the dark feminine, the qualities of like, I'm not going to stand for this anymore and I'm going to step up and I'm going to speak. And this is, you know, it's kind of like the mama bear protecting her cubs energy that is most needed right now and saying, I'm not going to stand for this bullshit anymore. Look out. And I'm going to come forward with deep compassion and deep love. And I'm angry and I'm pissed and things need to change. And I'm not going to stop until things change. And I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna yeah. um, stand by um, idle. Yeah. While you while you do that. Right. Meaning these are the conversations that I'll be having with men as well. 
I mean, that's yeah. my commitment. That's my absolute commitment is yeah. I, I am not going to stand by and let this happen any longer. And it, for me, it's like, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. I mean, we, you know, it's military, it's, it's environment, it's, you know, it's, it's political, destruction. It's finances. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Well, we could just, you know, print up $300 billion of monopoly money that has nothing of substance behind it. And we'll just throw it at the problem. It's like, Mm -hmm. Wait. Yeah, and it's like that's not how you fix the problem. That's, that's putting up that's, the, the that's giving the patient a pill and it's not like that's not going to fix the root source of what created this in the first place. Exactly. Which exactly. is what we need to start healing. Yeah, I, I think I think at least from my perspective the most powerful thing I could do right now is to say, you know what? I was wrong and I think I think I've made a mistake here in my life. Mm. Yeah. And that's, you know, the, the United States needs to do that on many levels yes. right now. Yeah. And I don't see that happening anytime in the near future, which is really frightening because that's the only way right. that we can get past all of this stuff that's coming up now is to go to the original wound and, you know, and, and mm -hmm. acknowledge ourselves for where we got it wrong and then make amends and try to move forward in a new way, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is why I was very much leaning towards Marion Williamson's, you know, platform for a president. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And wouldn't that like just change everything? Yeah. Um, and, and some, an image that kept coming up for me as you were talking, Karen, is, um, is the image of Kali and Kali, oh, yeah. she, you know, she is the great creator, but she is also the, the terrifying destroyer and yeah, yeah. that that feminine energy of destroying in order to rebuild and in order to rise from the ashes it's like i'm really holding that kali energy in my life right now what mm -hmm. has to what has to die away in order for something new to grow to take hold and um it's interesting that that goddess energy that mama bear energy that um that power and that strength of maternal protection and nurturance doesn't come from icons of america it comes from indigenous cultures and in other parts of the world and I mean, they understand that. They understand the balance of the king and the queen, the warrior and the Amazon, you know, the, mm -hmm. the father protector and the mother protector. So maybe the uh, United States has a whole lot to learn from the world, the rest of the world. And maybe mm -hmm. we'll finally be in a place of reception. I hope so. Yeah. Let's uh, let's go ahead and w let's wind this up. I you know I I, I have an, a fabulous idea I'll discuss with you guys later because I want to keep this going on. Next time we'll actually consider doing this on Zoom because Stephanie, I think it'd be fabulous if, if we shared some of your artwork, like you had mentioned, Callie, and I have all this artwork, you know, in, in the cloud. Yeah. And I. I'd like to journey down if you guys are open for it. Yeah. Yeah. Karen's sure. like smiling is uh, I, I want to, uh, I want to go down um, a little bit of Joseph Campbell and a mythology. little bit of archetype mythology. Right. And we can explore yeah. it together. Um, mm -hmm. th that would be just fantastic. So I'm hoping maybe Saturday mornings might be a little bit of our time. That's yeah. we have to figure that out. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much for being here and doing yeah, this. Great to see you again, Karen. Yeah. Great to see you. And thanks for having us. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not having you. You're having you. This is a big conversation. I feel like we barely scratched the surface. I uh, we did. I, I, that's yeah. why I'm wanting to wrap it up because I kind of didn't. Okay, great. I can see that. Holy mackerel. We'll need at least 20 minutes on that <laughs> one, but we won't right now. 
Hi, this is Stephanie Murphy, and I'm here today with Craig Barnes, and we are going to be talking a little bit about his new book, In Search of the Lost Feminine. Hi, Craig. Hi. Hi, Stephanie. <laughs> so, so, Craig, I understand that you have a background in law. I spent many years as a trial lawyer, that's right, and uh, some, of that, uh, some of those years were uh, uh, in civil rights cases. It had a lot to do with women's rights, women's wages cases. And that led to this book, In Search of the Lost Feminine, because we were, we were hammered in, in U.S. courts and the U.S. legal system. Legal system. It was um, inexplicable to male judges uh, why women would be complaining about their wages or their promotions or their entry into the field, into various professional fields, and why that would be a problem. And so we, uh, I, I tried a number of those cases, and some of them I won, but one big one I lost. And uh, the judge said... Uh, it was on behalf of nurses, nurses in the city of Denver. And the judge said, um, you know, the reason nurses are paid less is is that they go home and have babies. Well, they do that, but sometimes men take time off, you know, to work at home as well. And it didn't explain why professionals in, in, who are responsible for saving lives, who could measure out the tiniest portions of uh, drugs and uh, who could do nurturing in addition to analysis didn't explain why people who were on 12 hours on their feet in 12 hour shifts would be paid less than tree trimmers tree trimmers do useful things for the city mm -hmm. but they don't have responsibility for human life the way nurses do mm -hmm. and so when we did a comparison of nurses across the board with with uh, with uh, other professions and this was in the city of Denver in the 1970s we found that you could tell um, equal education, supervisory responsibility, and experience across the board. You could lay them out, all the professions of the city of Denver. You can compare those factors. And if there were women in that profession, nutritionists, dietitianists, uh, body therapists, if there were primarily women in that profession, and if everybody knew that, then that profession was going to be paid 10% less than other male professions across the board if they, and all they had, to, the only determining factor was maleness and femaleness. Mm. So we found out early on in, um, in, in the analyzing uh, civil rights cases that women were paid less and there was no explicable reason except history. So my search was, well, okay, wh where does this come from? And I went back to the nuns who worked for nothing in the hospitals and then went back to Florence Nightingale who lay in bed for 28 sure. years. You know, she was didn't want to compete with the doctors. Doctors shouldn't be competed with, so she didn't get out of bed. She just did her thing on behalf of nurse. From her bed, I went back to the witches, and I said, Judge, look, let me put put witch burnings in evidence. Let me show you where this comes from. we got a history of slavery, and that's the foundation. That's the predicate upon which we remedy wages for blacks and whites. Let me show you the predicate of burning witches as the basis for which upon which we ought to pay women more. The judge said, not in my court. You're not going there in my court. That's too much time, too much trouble. I'll tell you why they're paid less. They have children, and they leave the profession. And that was it. Hmm. And, the, and we spent um, five and a half plus years, thousands of hours, in preparing that case. The judge told me at the end of the case, best tried case he'd ever seen. He said, best tried case I've ever seen. We had stacks of, of, uh, of books with analysis of every wage, every profession in the city of Denver, every employment category. He said it's the best thing he'd ever seen. And he ruled against us without going back into chambers to think it over or write out an opinion. He just spoke from the top of his head. So after five and a half years, thousands of hours of work by the nurses in order to prepare these exhibits, pre presented in a way that he thought was high caliber, he didn't even take the time for these women to write an opinion that explained the legal basis for his decision. Now, that is a huge insult. That was in the 1970s. Mm -hmm. For that to be able to go on seemed to me to be inexplicable. I had a mother who was a generous mother, a wonderful mother, an intelligent mother. I couldn't figure out why, just because she was a female, that would somehow we'd have these results. And that was the beginning of the odyssey for this book, In Search of the Lost Feminine. What happened? At what time in our history did we get to the place where we somehow uh, demonized women or diminished women? And it turned out to be not just a diminishment, not just wage discrimination. It turned out to be demonization. Mm -hmm. It turned out to be misogyny, cold, hard misogyny from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And the beginning was not with the witches. It wasn't with Rome. It wasn't with Greece. It was before Greece. 
And when we saw what happened before Greece and then what happened when the Greeks came up against this women-centered culture, uh, it was stunning, the coincidence of the old values and the rejection by the Greeks in our mythology. So the long and short of the search for the lost feminine is that you find that um, we lost it because we created a mythology early on in the, in the millennium before Christ, in the f- millennium before the B.C., that we created a mythology which demonized women, Medusa, Harpies, Furies, Scylla, Charybdis, Sirens, mm-hmm. all images of women who, uh, who are, uh, will take a man down, will destroy a man, destroy his inheritance, destroy his independence, one thing or another. So this book, The Search of the Lost Feminine, and this work is to excavate those values that were here before that mythology mm-hmm. and to demonstrate how the mythology actually does its wicked will on mm-hmm. Western history. Mm-hmm. Well, I found the book so intriguing. And and you really, uh, in the book, go into a lot about um, the Greeks and particularly uh, Homer um in his Iliad and Odyssey and um but the book actually starts before that and uh where the book starts is is much earlier than that and i was very intrigued by that beginning you really take a different tact than say the writers uh in the late 80s uh, early 90s um Joseph Campbell um can you talk about that a little bit? Well, it was it was an extraordinary thing. The most uh, most archaeologists and most mythologists say that we can't understand what might have existed before the Greek period in our history, which is about b- before one thousand BC. We can't understand that, and the reason we can't understand it is because there's no literature, there's no writing at that point that tells us the stories of the Iliad and the Odyssey, no stories of war and battles and heroes and all of that before a thousand BC that are, were written down, and therefore we can't know what it was like then. And uh, I looked at and saw some of the archaeology of. Um, a Minoan civilization, 1500 B.C., and was stunned. Stunned by the grace and the elegance and the beauty of the wall paintings and the little seal rings with mm-hmm. men hunting and women uh, dancing under the moon and, and uh, uh, people doing ordinary tasks of fixing pots or fishing uh, or... Uh, take women taking opium or uh, you know using dancing with opium in ecstasy, or women bare breasted uh, w- gathering saffron uh, under the trees, totally unafraid of their sexuality, totally unafraid of ecstasy, totally living out in a way that is has not been repeated in Western culture since mm-hmm. 1500 it has not since been repeated in its in our art, so we don 't have any art in Western history with women dancing under the stars by themselves, except in a kind of lurid Boccaccio kind of way, or, or uh, sort of a, 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 a caricatured way. Mm-hmm. But here where we have a women in a most natural sense, uh, picking flowers, uh, next to monkeys swinging, next to dolphins leaping, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, they are uh, bare-breasted and sometimes they're dancing with their hips moving, and you think, man, is this a sensual picture. But it's not, um, it's not superficial. It's not trivialized the way Greek mythology trivializes mm-hmm. Aphrodite, mm-hmm. makes her a sort mm-hmm. of a wicked uh, uh, seductress. seductress, and that's all, just, just seductress. That's what we've got here. Mm-hmm. And she will do a manian, and she will do Zeus. And you just can't trust Aphrodite. The Aphrodite passion is the uh, beginning of the end for, for men. Well, these pictures before Aphrodite, before the incarnation of Aphrodite in this mythology, they are pictures of women who are exultant in their physicality, Mm -hmm. alive in their eyes, alive in their dancing, alive in their ecstasy. And you think, wait a minute, wait a minute. We haven't got a literature. That's true. We don't have a literature that tells us what they mean. But when I was putting evidence into court, if I had a picture, it was worth a thousand words, as we say, a picture of any situation in court situation is very valuable. So I couldn't say to myself, well, this doesn't mean anything. Of course it means something. It means a lot. So the question is, how do we figure out what it means? How do we analyze this material in a systematic way. When I went back through these huge books of analysis and then 
uh, 20th century, some beginning in the 19th century. None of them was very systematic in the way in which this, uh, this, these pictures, the pictures on the walls, the pictures on the pots, the, the pictures on the rings, the figurines, none of us are systematic to put that all together. So I thought, what if we try to analyze the values in this archaeology and see what we get? And what we got was women at the center instead of on the side, not diminished. We got women dancing, apparent and open in their sexuality. We got uh, women enjoying ecstasy and men enjoying the ecstasy of the excitement of the bull leaping and the excitement of the song of bringing in the harvest. So we had ecstasy, a wholly different thing than just sexuality, but ecstasy in itself being uh, alive. And we had the cycles of the seasons as if death were not some horrible thing, but death was the beginning of some new turn and that we could accept death and death would be no more dangerous to them than sleep. So all of that was apparent. And then finally, characteristic of this culture was no glorification of war, mm-hmm. no glorification of two men fighting, no example of a man attacking a woman, no example and thousands of images of a man attacking another man or a man attacking a woman. No evidence of war, no lists of kings, no lists of princes, no lists of conquests, all in Minoan culture, 1500 BC. You have to say to yourself, absence of war, women at the center, sexuality okay, ecstasy okay, and the cycles of the seasons, and isn't that different? Isn't that somehow remarkably different than what we have today? We're off the empire in Iraq. We are glorifying heroes. They're so great we can't see them dead. We have to have their caskets wrapped in fire, but we can't see them mm-hmm. dead. We have got an idea that that sexuality is dangerous or it can be trivialized to sell cars, but it is no way sacred for the reproduction and the continuation of life. It's not sacred at all. It's diminished. And, and, and we've got see, the, the linear time as if death is the end. How different in those five ways is our current, current culture than that old culture? And so, nice. I so, wait a minute. Not only are those five values different, everything in the Greek mythology that I'm reading, I began to read mythology about all these things, systematically rebuts those five values. It's not an accident. Mm-hmm. It's not because women are naturally less strong or don't like to go to war, and therefore, uh, you know, there were the misogyny in, in chasing women and killing women or getting angry about their sexuality is natural. It's because we were starting to tell stories to diminish women, and the stories had a purpose. And that, of course, is the revelation in the book. Yes. That the stories have a purpose. They're not natural history. We're not talking about the natural evolution of humankind. We're talking about what storytellers can do to control history and what they did and why we're today in Iraq. I mean, it's all it's all tied tied up. Why women are paid less. Why we don't value sexuality as something sacred, but rather value it as a sort of child's game. It, you know, all of that can be explained now by looking at the early values and the Greek rejection systematic, step-by-step rejection. When I saw that, I had one of those aha experiences. Uh Mm -hmm. This is how we got to where we are. Mm -hmm. So that's what the book is about, is to lay out the various myths, the Jason myths, the Heracles myths, the Achilles myths, the Iliad myths, the Odyssey myths, how they, they weren't just nice storytelling. They weren't just the Greek equivalent to Shakespeare. They were political propaganda to lay the foundation for patriarchal society in which women could, men could control their property and women wouldn't get in the way. Mm-hmm. And how did that start? How did that start? <laughs> there were there were more than there were more than one reason. If we if we're looking at about we can see about four central reasons that brought the transition from the society in which monkeys swinging and dolphins leaping and swallows kissing and women dancing and women take that as a caricature of the early society moving from that society society without war and without her- her- heroes into this new society which we call western culture there are about five re- four reasons the first was that that culture that Minoan culture was centered on the islands of Santorini and Crete and they suffered a horrific volcanic explosion in 1500, which absolutely uh, de- demolished Minoan culture. And if they had thought that the, that the earth was fertile and the cycles of the seasons were dependable and that Mother Earth was generous and that she brought back the fruits of the 
dying if you planted the dead seed in the ground it came back in the spring and wasn't that great all of a sudden mother earth had opened up in a horrendous explosion fire and stone and the sea rushing across to wipe out whole cities all of a sudden mother earth had become undependable cosmologically philosophically religiously devastating Mm -hmm. here we had our faith in the earth the maximum betrayal the maximum betrayal unearned Mm -hmm. who earned that Mm-hmm. So all of this attention to the earth and its f- fertility and the, the female of the species as the best replica of what earth does. She is the where the seed is planted and where the child comes from. And she is the closest replica of Mother Earth that we have in our human species form. She uh, represents that and it explodes and she's all of a sudden not trustworthy. So not only is the earth not trustworthy, nor are, are women. Mm-hmm. Then there are some economic reasons that are probably even more powerful. And these are reasons uh, as trade was expanding, as Minoan pottery was going all across the Mediterranean from the Black Sea to Gibraltar, as uh, pirates were becoming a problem for the sea trade, sons became more uh, central to survival. Sons had to fight off the pirates. They were if, they were if women were big-bellied and pregnant, they couldn't fight and hoist the masts as well as, as the men. So mm-hmm. sons began, began to become a premium. Mm-hmm. So instead of valuing primarily women whose, whose children represented the survival of the village, the continuation of life, mm-hmm. the whole idea of life continuing indefinitely, the daughters being so central and so important, instead of treasuring daughters because that's how the village was going to continue, mm-hmm. now sons became useful for fighting off pirates or becoming pirates and going to, to raid for food. Sons uh, become uh, significantly important. War becomes more useful because people are beginning to be rich beyond the requirements of this year's seed. They need, they've got abundance stored up. Yes. They've got excess stored up. If I take my raiders and go to that village and grab their excess grain, grab their pots, steal their women, that becomes uh, a, a new use for men. So war becomes useful. So you have the volcano. You have the increasing importance of trade. And you have the increase, increasing importance of, of, of sons. And those things combine in, in a way to... Uh, set the ground for the fourth reason, which was the storytellers who came along and said, wait a minute, if we have men joined up with women who can't tell who their sons are because the women have several partners, if sexuality among women is free and the men can't tell whose sons are theirs, how are they going to know to who to whom to leave this excess property? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The property, whole property system requires the knowledge of who's the father of this son. Yes. And this is the beginning of patriarchal property. If I need sons for, to fight off the pirates, I need to know which sons are mine to leave my swords and my wealth to. Yes. And in order to know that, I've got to sequester the women in a new way. I've got to keep them with one partner only. Mm-hmm. And women who are fooling around, women who have more than one partner, now need to be demonized. They need to be ostracized, but driven to the edge of culture. And that's what happens. So that's why we get the mm-hmm. Furies and the Harpies and the Sirens and Aphrodite mm-hmm. and Medusa with the snakes in her hair, the Gorgon who will look you in the eye and turn a man, good man, to stone. We get all of those things because, <laughs> because we need to control the property. Uh-huh. It's all about property. Uh-huh. So we get in the first millennium BC a shift. Uh, a property system shift, and women get hammered because of that uh, that need for patriarchal property. Mm-hmm. And then the mythology comes in. My kids, in my grandkids in Santa Fe today, are studying the Odyssey. When I was a fifth grader in a country school in rural wheat fields in Colorado, I studied the Odyssey. 
I'm part of a 2,800-year history of school children who studied the Odyssey. We studied the Odyssey. We laid down the foundation of Western culture by studying the Odyssey. Yes. Everybody, every kid ought to know. And what does he know? He knows that Penelope ought to stay home and weave her rug while, the, while Odysseus is sleeping around the Mediterranean as much as he wants. Yes. That's the role for men and women for 2,800 years. We're still teaching it in our schools today. And that's why we write a book that says, all right, the time has come. Time to change stories. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Why do you think that there is such a resurgence of interest now in the goddess, in the lost feminine? Well, I think that I think that um, we have been evolving for about 150 years out of the property system which corralled women which made them have to play the role of the subordinate, subservient house slave, in effect. Mm -hmm. As they began in Western culture to be able to own property and to to will it and to inherit it rather than having it go back through the male line, as that evolution in the property system occurred, they began to say to themselves, we don't have to take this, beginning with Susan B. Anthony and, and those early pioneers, Mary Wollstonecraft of in the seventeen ninety mm-hmm. Wollstonecraft. In order to to, they began to say to themselves, "Wait a minute, I, I don't have to take this abuse." Well, it took two hundred years for them to finally begin to create a story of their own, which is that we're not just uh, housewives, we're not just subordinates, we're not chattel anymore. We are not even just equal partners. We participate in the divine. We are of the divine ourselves. We should not ever forget we are of the... That's a new story. Mm -hmm. You take the story of the sirens. They are uh, of the 7th century BC. Women are... uh, will uh, promise a man knowledge and leave him putrid and dying on the rocks. They'll eat him alive Mm -hmm. and leave him dying on the rocks. That's not the story of women participating in the divine. That's the story of women misusing the divine. Or the story of Calypso, who wants to keep Odysseus on on her shores. She says, I'll give him love. And Zeus says, in effect, love is not what makes us work here. What makes it work is him going home to his property and his estate. And now, finally, Calypso is reborn. And in the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, we begin to say, wait a minute. Women are saying, we participate in the divine. And men who are experiencing that in their women are becoming liberated. It's a men's liberation that's happening. you got a, a, a woman with whom you can speak, who can disagree with you, who can set you straight or love you for who you are instead of your role you play. That's a whole new man. So Mm. men are being liberated. It's not just women. It's men and women being liberated. Mm. And in that liberation comes creativity, uh, responsiveness, uh, uh, intelligence, judgment, maturity. That's probably why the Vietnam War in the 1960s, the first war to be stopped by the people, there's a reservoir of common intelligence amongst the people who said, this isn't working we will stop. Why? Because the feminine by that time it was playing such a huge role mm-hmm. in American culture, American psyche. Mm-hmm. 15 million people on February 15th, 2003, around the world saying, "We this war that's planned for Iraq does not make sense. Not possible for the Crimean War in the, 18th, in the 19th century. Not possible for Napoleon's wars. Women were quiet. Women couldn't say a thing. Not possible for Louis the Fourteenth's war. Not po- possible for El Cid's war. Men are entirely in control. What ha- what has happened? Women have not only freed themselves, but freed men to be whole people, whole people who value life, L- not just death, but life. And in order to value life, in order to participate in the valuation of life, you can ask the question about war. Fifteen million people before a war began saying no to it around the world. That's a part of where we've gotten to because of this mutual liberation that's occurred. It's occurring. We're in the process. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We are. I appreciated how you wrote this book like 
teasing apart a fabric, mm-hmm. slowly um, showing the jury the evidence, if you will. It uh, it really spoke to me of of your law background, and um, as a juror, I was uh, surprised and amazed and convinced. And uh, sitting here listening to you talk about it, um, I'm very appreciative of the light that you've shown on the subject. I I feel like um, in the genre of uh, goddess literature, um, I, I feel like your book is um, destined for greatness. Mm-hmm. It 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 takes um, what has been out in the literary world for uh, twenty years to a whole new level, and um, I thank you very very much for that. Well, coming from you, that's a great compliment because I know you've read it all. <laughs> I appreciate your saying that. You know, I had to, as I worked my way along. This was in process over about a twelve year period. As I worked my way along, I very often stopped and said, "My goodness, what am I doing here?" What am I doing in this field? There are people who know the the derivation of pots from 3000 B.C. down to 1000 B.C. They know the different designs on every pot. They know what language traces back to Central Asia and what traces back to the Caucasus and what, you know. And there are people who know uh, the rhythms of of, uh, agricultural life. There are people who know every celebration that occurred. And what am I doing in their field? Mm-hmm. But then I, I I kept finding myself reading through some of this very dense, very turgid, very uh, knowledgeable material, and and seeing how far it had strayed from uh, real analysis, how far they, how much the academic community was itself caught up in its norms. It would say we mustn't project modern values back backwards. So anybody who says the Minoans were peaceful or just is just a peacenik today saying that everybody was peaceful back then, isn't that great? Mm-hmm. But then I noticed that they were saying war has list- existed forever. War war is absolutely natural. And what is that? That's projecting modern values backwards. That's saying here we are, we're at yeah. war, so therefore we've always been this way. I thought, well I can do as well as that. You know, if it's, so let's anal- analyze the evidence. So if we do what we have to do in court and not just say this is the way people are, but let's look at the evidence. When you look through thousands of items of material, wall paintings and and pots and figurines, and find that of those thousands of items, not one of them represents two men at war, I have to say, okay, I I can shift the burden of proof back to you, all you war is forever people. Show me where it existed here. Show me what the evidence is. I'm not interested in your opinion about human nature, your unscientific sort of generalization about human nature. Just tell me where the evidence is. If you got the evidence, I'll show you my evidence. I've got about a thousand things I can show you. What have you got that you can, I've got more than that, that, you know, that I can show you, and there's not one thing of men fighting or men attacking a woman. So if it's not there, it's not there. And you're telling the court, you're telling the jury, it will come. We will get it. We know it's out there somewhere. It's under some heap at Chatal Hayuk. It's under some heap at, at uh, Akrotiri that hasn't been dug up yet. It's there. We know it's going to be there. We're going to show that war has been forever. And I say to the judge, I say to the jury, okay, you've got this th- many thousands of pieces of evidence that we've got in front of you, and you've got the promise from counsel on the other side that someday he or she will bring to you the evidence. What's more persuasive? Mm-hmm. Well, most juries so far that I've spoken with, <laughs> they will we'll take the evidence we've got for at least for now, you know. And it's 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 far more analytical. It's it's actually interesting that outside of the profession, the academic professions, we can bring to this a method of analysis that is better in this way than the analysis that they're using. Yes. So I had to say to myself, Am I going to go to sleep? Here I am at one in the morning. Am I going to go to sleep with a sense of failure that I'm not up to this? Or am I going to do my best, lay out the evidence as well as I can see it? And I'd be about to go to sleep, and then I'd realize, wow, there's the Parthenon, the famous, famous Parthenon. Every one of the wars on the side of the Parthenon, this architectural magnificence, 5th century B.C., every one of the wars has to do with what? Has to do with marriage. Whoa. 
mm-hmm. has to do with marriage. Marriage is the cornerstone of patriarchy. Mm-hmm. Marriage is the basis of patriarchy. Without marriage, your sons are not, you know, know whose sons are whose. If you don't know whose sons are whose, you can't have a patriarchal property system by definition. Mm-hmm. It's a monument to patriarchy and property. It's not just a glorious monument. And so one thing after the next would come up like that. Whoa, look at that. It's actually all about retaining the property in the hands of men. And it worked so beautifully because it was cloaked in these uh, remarkably well-told stories. It's as, as if Homer was a paid publicist for patriarchy. He did a great job. Mm-hmm. He did a great job. But he did a job systematically to, uh, to reject everything that we can think of as um, life-sustaining. If we think of the feminine, let's talk about that for a minute. What do we mean by the feminine, the lost feminine? Mm-hmm. What was lost? Are we, are we just going to go around glorifying women and saying women are great and men are not great? That would be, that would be utter nonsense. Mm-hmm. Are we just going to say, well, women have been suppressed and they ought to be freed? That's also very superficial. What are we, we're saying, wait a minute, There is something larger in this picture with men singing in the harvest or dolphins leaping or monkeys singing or bees pollinating. Something in the cycles of the seasons and the spirals we see that suggests not just female fertility. We're not just talking about fertility. We're talking about something that goes on on the on the coffins, the sarcophagi spirals. Life goes on Mm -hmm. through the mediation of women. Life goes on through the mediation of women and their daughters. Is it about women? No, it's about life. It's about the process. It's about the process. And it's about life. It's about, and the women are the closest we have in the human species to the vehicle through which life goes on. Yes. But they're surrounded in these images with grain, Mm -hmm. with swallows mating, with dolphins Mm -hmm. mating. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing all of these images not just about let's let's get the women on top, let's get the women back in power. Nonsense, utter nonsense. What we're talking about is the much larger picture yes. of life and what it takes for life to continue. That's what was there, and that's what we we ignore at our at our great peril. So if we can think of the of the feminine as this larger impulse for life to sustain itself. To life to sing its own song, life in search of itself. If that's what we're doing, we are participating in an ongoing pageant, attempting to play a role for life to con- that will allow life to continue. We are head up against nuclear weapons. They're talking as we speak about using nuclear weapons mm-hmm. to take out Iran. We're head up against the arrogance of power as if every man today, every general was an Achilles or a Hector and about to go off and save the world through power of arms. That story is dead up against now, this knowledge that we have as humans that life is in jeopardy. And the recovery of the feminine is the recovery of our reverence for life, our reverence, our willingness to do whatever it takes to keep life going in all its forms. And and that makes most of this conversation about Iraq and Iran substantially irrelevant, except as it threatens life. Iraq and Iran and oil in Iraq and Iran is not, is not going to preserve the American empire. It's not going to preserve life. It's actually mm-hmm. doing the opposite. It changes the nature of the discussion if we realize what we're talking about in the search for the lost feminine. Absolutely. Is life. What does it take for life to continue in all its forms, in all its rich forms? That's the search for the lost feminine. Hmm. Craig Barnes, thank you so much. Thank you.